Good morning, church. <laughs> We're enjoying our visiting this morning, and it's so good to see again after so long of, of having to keep distance and everything else. It's good to see us getting back to the church that we once were, the loving, friendly church. It's good to see. Hines? Number 13. Can you hear me now? All right, let's uh, stand together, and I'm just going to read for you Isaiah 6. This is one of my favorite portions of Scripture because it uh, gives me something to meditate on when I'm thinking about what it'll be like when I'm in heaven. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a life, live coal, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. All right, let's just open with a word of prayer. Father, I just want to thank you this morning that you are the Lord seated on the throne. We're not some distant, faraway thought, but we are ever on your mind. You are pursuing us at all times, longing to be in relationship with us. And God, as we gather this morning, we just want to say to you, as small as an offering as it is, we want to be in relationship with you. We want to fellowship with you. And so, God, as we sing these songs this morning, Lord, please receive them as our, our song of praise and adoration to our King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord Jesus, please take up your residence in our heart, in the place that it should be, Lord over all. May all the things of this world that crowd our hearts and our minds slip away as we just rest in your presence this morning, Lord God. And may you truly be in this place in your people's hearts, and may we receive what we have to offer, and may it bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
if there are kids here, um, you can go to Sunday school at this time and there will uh, be some activities for you downstairs.
you stand and pray with us? Father, we thank you that we could come before you today, that we could gather like this and praise and worship you. Oh Lord, how we praise you today. Father, we think about how wonderful you are, how beautiful you are. We think about your characteristics. We think about you sending your son, Jesus. Father, we thank you that he would come and he would lay down his life so that we might have life. We thank you that by his death, he would put death to an end forevermore for us. Oh, we may and need to die earthly death. But you have already united with us in our spirit as we're born again in you, Jesus, giving our lives to you. And we thank you for that. And Father, we know that even our bodies will be raised from the dead one day, and we thank you for that. We have so much to be grateful for, so much to be thankful for. We will be with you in your presence for all glory, forevermore, for all eternity. And we thank you for that. And Father, today we just pray for those that are struggling I know amongst us we have some that are struggling in their body. And Lord, won't you meet their needs? Won't you bless their bodies today? Help them. Take some of that pain from them, we pray. And Lord, I pray that where there's been a bad report, that you would bring some good news. I pray that where people are feeling like you haven't been there for them, that you will show them that you have. I pray for that. I pray, Lord, where people are feeling lonely, they will sense the presence of God and God's people with them. I pray, Lord, that where there is a struggle financially, you will meet those needs. Where there is not an ability to put food on the table anymore, that you will meet that need. And Father, where there is loneliness for someone who who needs a spouse, (laughs) I pray that you will bring that person at the right time. And not just any person, but the right person. Oh, Lord, we pray for these things. And Father, we just continue to thank you that we could come and we can worship you. Oh, Lord, how grateful we are for that. We tell you today that we love you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated, family. Good to see you. Good to be with you today as well. I am just glad that we can gather for a worship service and be together with each other. I'm so glad that uh, there's some good things that are coming to our church. Say hello to those who are listening in online. Would you just welcome them? Give them a shout out. Welcome to those. And if you're here for the first time, my name is Pastor Hines. It is good to have you here. And uh, right on, right on. I stand on a rock, that's for sure. (laughs) You don't want to see me dance, trust me. You don't want to see me dance. Hey, there's some good things coming. The Canadian Awakening is coming, and there's some posters and there's some information about that in the foyer, so check that out, and uh, that's going to be happening here on a Monday, but it's a far bigger thing than that, and uh, it's a week-long ministry that uh, Tommy Zito and his evangelistic team are bringing to Canada, and and so it's a week-long here in the Edmonton and greater area, and us being in Stony Plain, we get to host them for one day, and that's the 20th of June, that's coming up real quick. And that is a Monday, and that'll be from 9 o'clock till 9 o'clock. There'll be breaks in between. You'll be able to go home and have a nap. You know, that kind of stuff is all all in play as well. But how wonderful it's going to be to go out and canvas our area and get to know some people that maybe we've never met before, that we can go and we can evangelize again. We can knock on doors and tell people about the Lord Jesus and to tell them that there's hope and to tell them that life is worth living when they know the Lord. And so that's what we want to do is bring that hope to them. And so that's coming. At the end of the month, June 26th, we want to celebrate you. And so the majority of you, if not all of you, volunteer here at New Life Community Church in one way or another, and we want to celebrate that. And so we're going to have a wiener roast, and it's going to be barbecue style. And so a couple of barbecues are going to be going, and we're going to be eating downstairs. But we need you to bring a little bit to share with each other, too. So the main meal is provided, but bring something that you would like to share with others. And so uh, that's on June 26th, that barbecue potluck. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer 
Check it out. Write down what it is that you'd like to bring. Uh, we're going to celebrate uh, the fact that uh, you're volunteering. We're going to celebrate the fact that we are a church and we are a family and we're going to eat together. Because I know that summer's on, we're on the cusp of it, right? And a lot of people, they kind of get moving on to other things throughout the summer. And some of you, unfortunately, it's like snowbirds. We don't see you till the fall. And so um, we want to make sure that we've eaten with you if that's the case for you. All right? We want to be able to be with you. So a lot of good things happening. Hey, yesterday we had congregational prayer here. We had 18 people show up. 18 people came. I think it's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And what a powerful hour of prayer it was. And so I'm going to encourage you, if you haven't been to congregational prayer, that happens once a month, but every Saturday there's prayer. And so at 9.30 every Saturday the men gather for prayer. That one Sunday throughout the month at 10.30, we gather as a, as a body of believers for prayer. And it was absolutely powerful. People standing in all different areas of this church just praying over you. Did you know that you're being prayed over? If there's anything good in your life, it's because God's people are praying for you and the power of God is at work in your life. Would you agree? That's what prayer does. That's what prayer does. Hey, let's, let's pray together, and we're going to get into this, continue into this sermon series. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you're with us today. We want to learn more about you, Jesus. We want to learn more about the Father in heaven. We want to learn more about the Holy Spirit. Father, we want to learn more about the God who is three in one. Oh, Father, thank you. We praise you today. We thank you that we can learn about you. We thank you that you would equip us. But we pray that you would open the souls of who we are and let us take in what it is that you want us to hear today. Let us be more than just hearers of the word, but let us be doers of the word as the Bible tells us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you want to thrive in life? Do you? So what does that mean? To thrive. You know, if you were to look that up in the, in, in the online dictionary, you would come to see that that definition of thrive has several meanings. It is to grow luxuriantly. Are you with me? To grow luxuriantly. Doesn't that just captivate your heart? You're stunned by that definition. There wasn't one reaction. That's what it means to thrive when you look that up on the, on the online dictionary. It means nothing luxuriantly. What is that? That's fabricated. That's synthetic. That means i got to put it on. To prosper, to thrive, to achieve success. These are the things that I'm reading online. A flourishing business, in other words. To be in a state of activity or product production. To reach a height of development or influence. The company, for example, flourished with record profits under the new owner. That's what it means to thrive when you look it up in the world's definition, in the dictionary. But God has another definition. To thrive. To thrive doesn't mean that we're always going to win. To thrive doesn't mean that we're going to continue to take steps forward and never run backward. To thrive also means that, yes, there will be times in your life as a believer in Jesus Christ that you will take two steps forward and one backward. You know, yesterday when it comes to thriving, and this, this is a very current event. Anybody do laundry here late at night? Or is it just me? Man, every once in a while you've got to watch what your washing machine is doing. And I thought we were thriving yesterday. Tammy and I had the greatest day. But when you have the greatest day, guess what? The enemy comes and he wants to push on you. You know what Tammy and I did throughout the day? We had pockets of prayer for each other. We went for a walk and we just prayed. We just burst out in prayer every once in a while for one another. And we were just thriving. Our hearts were just bursting with love for each other and, and for God. And God was with us in that. And then we come home and I do a load of laundry. And I'm hearing the washing machine. In, I'm in the kitchen and our laundry room is just over in the mudroom. And all of a sudden, I hear this big burst. <laughs> okay, that's not normal. I just come out of the shower because it was a sweaty, hot day yesterday, and there is water 
everywhere, and it is just coming out. The hot water of all things, where it comes out of the tap and goes into the washing machine, broke. The hose broke, and it is bursting everywhere. Guess what? You know, in that moment, the first thing as humanity that you want to do is you want to swear, and you want to, you want to do all that kind of stuff. That's human. But you know what I was doing? In that moment, because I've been walking close with God all day, I was saying, God, have mercy on me. I don't know how hot that is. I see that electrical wire there. Am I going to get electrocuted? God, have mercy on me. Were the words coming out of my mouth? Have mercy on me. And I was able to stop it, shut that tap off. I had to pull the dryer out of the way to do it. It was a mess. It was a mess. But you know what? At the end of the day, it's only water. It's only water. But that's what Satan wants to do. He sees that you take two steps forward and he wants to knock you down and get you to take another step back and to curse God. That's what he wants you to do. But we are believers and we will thrive no matter what happens to us. No matter what happens to us. So lesson be learned. Maybe stay home while your washing machine is running. Okay? <laughs> All right. Because <laughs> you just never know. You never know. First Peter 2, 9 to 12 is where we're headed. This is what Peter said to the church, and this is what God is saying to us today. You are a chosen people. God chose you. Everybody look up at me. I'm going to point at you not to be rude, but God chose you. He chose you, every single one of you. Did you know that he chose every person that is born in the world? The Bible tells us in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish but would have everlasting life. That every human being that is born in this world is created in the image of God. Every single one of them. Every one of them has an opportunity to come to know Jesus. Everybody will have their hearts knocked on at some point in their life. It will be as Revelation 3.20 says, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come in and I will have supper with them is really what the Bible is saying. It is the Trinity of God that comes into your life. It is that that comes into your life. And that's a big step forward in thriving as a person, as a human being. And Peter tells those good people who were being persecuted by who? The world was persecuting them. A lot of times when we look into the Bible, we see that persecution comes from within. In other words, the military is imploding from within. They're killing each other on that same side. They don't even need an enemy because they're an enemy to each other. And that's often what the church has done. That's often what we have done in our faith. But in this case, it is the world. It is the world outside that is pressing in on these Christians. And Peter reminds them that you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. And he is talking about Israel. But he is also talking about the rest of the world, the Gentile nation who are grafted in and who are now a family member with the Jewish nation under God through Jesus Christ. And he says God's special possession is who you are. And you need to know that today. And some of you aren't feeling like you're very special. But you are. You are unique. And you are special. And God made you for such a time as this. And He has given you life. And today He said, I breathe life into you again. And so I say, God, don't let that washing machine hose break ever again. That was awful. He says, you'll be able to take it. You'll be fine. You're special. You're special, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Don't curse God when you take a step back. Don't curse him. Bless him by speaking well of him. Go into every situation saying, God, have mercy on me. If you see that car coming at you head on, say, God, have mercy on me. Praise him. Praise him. Because you don't know what's coming. You don't know what's coming but practice praising Him. Now, you, when I say practice it, I don't mean just do it from the outside. Do it from within of who you are. Verse 10 says, Once you were not a people. 
Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. God, have mercy on me. God, have mercy on me. This is what it means to thrive, how to flourish, how to thrive in life. You do it with God. Once we were not a people. We had no hope, in other words. Even the Israelites, they had no hope until God made himself known to them. And he said, you are now my special people. And then, of course, we as the Gentiles were grafted in. So we thrive as the Gentile nation, as sons and daughters of God. Did you know that you were a son? Did you know that you're a daughter of our Lord? Did you know that? Yes, we are disciples of Jesus Christ, but we are also sons and we are daughters. Every one of you, if you're a woman here, say, I am a daughter of God. If you're a man, you say, I am a son of God. You are. Now, he had one begotten son, and that was Jesus, sent to die for us. But we are sons and we are daughters, and you need to claim that. And you need to remember that. When the world wants to curse you, remember that God is blessing you. And like the children of Israel who departed from the Lord, and there was once a time in their life they were prostituting themselves. In other words, they were unfaithful to God. They were worshiping other gods. They had come to know God. They came to know Him. And then they parted their ways with Him. And they began to worship other gods. And we too were once not the people of God because of sin. Sin separated us from God. Yet God said to Israel in Hosea 1, 10 to 11, You were once not my people, but one day again you will be called sons of the living God. And yet the Israelites will be like the sand of the seashore, which can't be measured or counted in the place where it was said to them. See, there was a covenant that God made with Abraham, and he promised them descendants as many and multitude as the stars in the sky. And he said in Hosea 1, 10 to 11, you're not my people, and they will be called children of the living God, the people of Judah, And the people of Israel will come together and they will appoint one leader and will come out of the land for great will be the day of Jezreel. Friends, we become sons of the living God by grace, not merit. We don't deserve God's grace, but thankfully he extends it to us. There was once a time in your life when you were not God's people. But today you are. And who afforded us that? Jesus. Jesus did. And 2 Corinthians 6.18 says, And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And because of grace, we can access God personally through prayer and directly through Jesus, who is our mediator. So who are we? And how do we thrive? You won't thrive until you have an identity. You won't thrive until you have an identity. Until you claim that you are a son, that you are a daughter of our Lord Jesus Christ, you will not thrive. Until you find your identity in Jesus, you will struggle the rest of your life. But when you have Jesus in your life, that struggle starts to dissipate. And then you have events in your life, times in which you're tested. But it gets somewhat easier at times, although it might seem like it's hard. When we know who we are, we can then do what? Make good choices and live a good lifestyle. What does it mean to live a healthy lifestyle as a Christian today? That's sometimes hard to define, isn't it? It's sometimes challenging to know. And and we sometimes want to use the world as our sounding board. But when we look out into the world, I tell you today, that is not the sounding board that you are trying to, to, to or should be looking at to figure out whether you as a believer in Christ is living a healthy lifestyle. Where is the sounding board that you should be looking at? The Bible. Absolutely. We need to be looking here to find out Am I headed in the right direction? And so I hope that you're doing that, and I hope that you're doing it regularly. Good lifestyle and good choices doesn't always lead, however, 
to preferred end results. As I said to you earlier, we made good choices yesterday, Tammy and I. We made great choices. But the end result was I got two showers. That's what happened. So you do everything in your, in your power to do what is right, but will the end result always be what you hope it to be? No. It's not always the way you hope it to be because you're thinking as a human being. You're thinking as a human being. You're saying that the end result should be perfect. The end result when we get to heaven will be perfect. But we will have struggle. We will have struggle. But yet to make those good choices is still worth doing in your life because you don't grieve the Holy Spirit and you please the Father by the decisions and the, and, and the obedience in your life. You know, being called sons of the living God comes with responsibility. We're supposed to live differently. We just simply are. In other words, when you smack your thumb, are you supposed to be, are you, are you supposed to be swearing like the rest of the world? Some might say, well, I'm just human. Yeah, we are just human. But we're supposed to be set apart. Isn't there at some point in our lives supposed to be some transformation? Isn't there at some point in our lives supposed to be a change of our mind? Isn't there at some point in our lives as Christians supposed to be some difference that we make? Isn't that supposed to be? Absolutely. Will we still have struggles with some of the little things? Yes, we will. Trust me, these eyes are not always perfect. You know that. And I wish that they were, but I'm taming them, and I'm training them. But you know what I'm finding as I tame and train these eyes from the outside? The real problem is in here. It's in the root, in my soul. And when I only try and train these eyes not to lust or train these eyes not to covet or train this mouth not to gossip or train whatever, to train this mind not to think maliciously, to train my soul not to judge others, if I do that from the outside, I will never get at the heart of what is going on. i got to look deep within. And that's where I've got to pluck out this root. I've got to pluck out that root. And when I pluck out that root, these eyes start seeing better. This mind starts thinking better. This soul starts getting clarity again. And I start making good choices. And I start living a good lifestyle. Not based on what the world would say, because the Christians in Peter's day were being persecuted for the decisions that they were making because they weren't making the same decisions as they were out in the world. And so what happens is the world says, oh, you think you're better than I am. No, I don't think I'm better than you are. But God has called me to be different. So when someone challenges you on that in the world and says, you think you're better than me because you're not coming to the bar with me. You think you're better than me because when I pass you a, a joint, you don't take a, you don't take a, you know, a, a toke of it. You think you're better than me. No, I don't think I'm better than you. But I have a right to choose. And I choose what I choose based on what the Bible says. He's called me to be different. And so you need to stand on that. Be different. Be different. Good choices. Good lifestyle. Peter goes on. That's what he says, 1 Peter 2, 11 to 12. He says, dear friends, you're my friends. You know that, right? You are my friends, and I love you. And we've traveled through life together, haven't we? And we've gone through ups. We've gone through downs. We've gone through highs, and we've gone through lows. We've gone through COVID together. We've gone through a flood in this basement. You remember that? Twice. Oh, you had to tell me that. What is this thing in water? You know, <laughs> what a struggle. You get your feet wet. You get your face wet. Like, this is life. This is life, isn't it? And we live it together. 
And, and these things happen. And so what the Lord is saying is this, friends, praise God through it all. It's only life on this side of heaven, and we know that on this side of heaven we're going to have our challenges. He says, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, he says, do this. I, he says, I know that the world is crushing and oppressing you. Abstain from sinful desires. Abstain from it. In other words, there are some things I just have to say no to. I have to as a person. If I say yes to th certain things, I'm going down the wrong path in my life. I'm going back to the way I lived before I knew Jesus. That quick. That quick. Within a day or two, I'll be lost. I'll be a lost soul again. And so we do play a part in working out our salvation. Not that we've earned it. Jesus did all that for us. Don't get me wrong. But we got to work in partnership with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is talking to us. And he is saying, there's got to be a better way to do this. You don't need to smoke that. You don't need to take that drink. You don't need to look at pornography. You don't need to do these things. But all these things are coping mechanisms for the struggles that we have in our lives. And when we remove the coping mechanisms in our life, guess what? We see the bitter root in our soul. But many of us don't want to stare at that for too long, so we go back to the coping mechanisms because it's just easier when we patch than to really fix. And so when we see what's really in the soul, we need to say, God, that's what we need to root out because that's really behind all of this. That's what's making me angry. That's what's making me bitter. That's what's bringing me to rage. That's what's making me look at these things. That's why I'm taking the drink. That's why I'm smoking dope. That's why I'm doing these things. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires. Peter knew that if we didn't abstain from these things, we would never get at the root of the problem. And he wanted those believers to get to the root of the problem. He says, these are the things that wage war against our soul. And remember, when we came to faith in Jesus, our spirit was made new. It was made perfect. And when you have a perfect spirit that is in you, and you've got a soul that is being made perfect in the process of it, they war against each other. They butt heads. That's what they do. Live, he says in verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans, the world, the godless. That's what he is saying. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. I've been in the workforce a long time before I came into ministry. Over 20 years as a heavy duty mechanic. And I know that some of you are in dark places in the world. And so was I. There were days that I would sit in front of that shop before I went in to punch the clock. And I'd say, oh dear God, have mercy on me. I got to go in there again? You don't know these guys. You don't know these women. <laughs> oh my goodness. He says, I do. You need to learn to love them. Okay, God, what does that look like? Over 20 years in that industry, and I started to love the people, the men and the women, and guess what? I was doing weddings for some of the people that I never got along with for their daughters. I was doing funerals. I was taking calls from people that were dealing with people in their own lives that had physical issues, and they were calling me and asking, would you pray for me? That's where it led. That's where it led. So don't give up in those dark places. I was telling Tammy, when I took a job, I remember going to Canadian Freightways. It was the dingiest, dirtiest shop I have ever worked in. And I had an opportunity to choose between that and four other places. And sometimes when we choose things as Christians, we wonder why, but there is something pulling you. There is something inspiring you. It is the Holy Spirit that leads you. And I chose the worst of all the shops to go to, and it became the best place I ever worked at because they were the hardest people I had ever worked with. 
and they became the softest later on in life because the Holy Spirit leads. And you know, as I was ministering to people, he was working on that bitter root deep within my soul, and he says, Heinz, you're just like them. (laughs) You're just like them. You fit this crowd. In other words, I was a pretty hard guy. And while he was softening them through the ministry that he had me doing, he was softening me. And here I stand in front of you today saying, if I could do it, so can you. Amen? So can you. Hmm. Knowing the difference between right and wrong. I got a couple more minutes with you. Knowing the difference between right and wrong. Galatians 5, 16 to 26, I would just love it if you would read that at some point, maybe even today. It's all about living by the Spirit, about the power of the Spirit that is at work in us. Do you honestly believe that our world is so different than Peter's was back when he wrote this? I don't think so. People are people. They've always been. You've got your soft, you've got your hard. You got your difficult, you got your easy. You got your tall, you got your short. You got your big, you got your skinny. You got everything. We're all different. But we're all beautiful. Every one of us. All beautiful. No different. Do we know the difference between right and wrong in this postmodern world that claims truth is what you make it? That's what the world is telling you. That's what the world is selling you. Truth is what you want it to be. But the Bible says otherwise. The Bible says truth is what Jesus said. Truth is what the Bible says. These are the truth claims. These are the promises. In other words, truth, what the world is trying to tell you, says that truth doesn't have to be grounded biblically, but as believers, we know that it needs to be. Because if it isn't grounded biblically, then we are no different than the world, and we will not be difference makers, and you will not make a difference in your workplace. You will not make a difference in your family units if the Bible isn't foundational in your life and is the truth by what you stand on. Western philosopher Plato, he lived approximately 400 years before Peter came on the scene and wrote this. Plato had already written about the immortal battle between right and wrong. And so this is nothing new. And Old Testament scriptures had already recorded much on the topic of right and wrong. In other words, we had already been given the Ten Commandments. God was already showing the people way before these philosophers of what right and wrong is, what God loves and what God doesn't. And I think what Peter is trying to get at here is that Christians must avoid everything and anything that could hurt the body, hinder the spiritual development of the soul, and destroy brotherly love and fellowship or weaken one's ability to be a Christian witness to someone else. And he is telling us how we can do this effectively. You know, we have an enemy, and I'm not that enemy. (laughs) We have an enemy, and it isn't the pagan out there, the unbeliever, and that's, I know it's a crass word, it's a hard word, but it is a word, and it's to define the godless. And I would like to soften that word a little bit by saying the not yet Christian. There's a lot of not yet Christians out there. There's a lot of them. And God is asking us to reach them. And Satan and his demons are working hard. And they're working overtime to get you and I off our Christian morals. And you know how he is doing it? Distraction. Distraction. Oh, he tried to distract me last night. Oh, he tried to distract us three years ago when we had two floods in the basement. Oh, he tried to. Oh, no, he tried to distract us again over these last two years during COVID. And now he is trying to distract many of us as we are re-engaging in society to say that all these other things are far more important because now I can indulge them again. Far more important than God. Far more important than God's family. Far more important than participating in a church. Far more important. I want to read to you something. Wonderful sister in Christ gave me this book here this last week. Dr. David Jeremiah, spiritual warfare. You and I, we need to know that there's a battle. 
This is what he says about distraction. He says, how does Satan actually use the strategy of distraction? Well, he does so to get us off our game, and this is how he does it. The idea of staging an intervention in a person's life to arrest the progress of some kind of injurious or unwise behavior is well known. We all know what interventions are, right? We've got someone who's an alcoholic. We want to intercede. We want to intervene. We want to get them to dry out. So we want to we want to step in and we want, to, we want to make them know that we love them as people and we have something set up for them so that they could detox, they, could, they can come off the drugs or the alcohol, whatever. We know what interventions are. They're very popular in this day and age. The goal in intervention is to intervene. It's to break the normal cycle of behavior and substitute some clinical help or other better behaviors. We want people to take what we see as bad behavior and make good decisions and start behaving better. That's what we're trying to do in these interventions. Dr. David Jeremiah goes on and he says this. He's, he builds a contrast as to how Satan intervenes in our life. Just so, he says, Satan loves to intervene in our lives to do just the opposite. Distract us from our healthy spiritual behaviors and tempt us with bad behaviors. If he can distract us from the spiritually productive priorities in our life and occupy us with the things of this world, his intervention will be successful. If we are too busy... To pray, if we are too busy to pray, if we are too busy to study the Bible, if we are too busy to serve others, if we are too busy to attend church, raise our families in the church, or too busy to be in Bible studies or small groups or disciples that are growing, then we will not grow spiritually. And that's exactly where he wants you. That's where he wants you. Because if he can get you there, he makes you numb spiritually. And you start feeling nothing again. We will remain babes in Christ in this state. There's nothing wrong, he says, with being busy. And I like staying busy. Trust me, I didn't mind fixing that washing machine. Just don't like doing it at 10 o'clock at night after I already had a shower. There's nothing wrong with staying busy. I love cutting the grass. I love staining the deck. I love working on cars. I love, if, if I could have another job on top of what I do for you as, as, as a pastor, I'd probably think about doing it. I love staying busy. Because idleness for this mind is not good. Trust me. When I sit around doing nothing, it's not a good thing. My mind wanders, and I start complaining, and I start seeing a dark world, and I start to flirt with lust, and all these kinds of things. So he isn't saying that it's not okay. He, he, that's not okay, but he's not saying that busyness is a bad thing. But what are you busy with? Surfing the net all day? Playing video games all night? Is it always about my stuff and never about God's stuff? Am I so busy building my own empire, my own bank account, that I've neglected God's bank account? I've neglected God's church. Have I spent so much time building my own house that I've neglected the Lord's? What are you busy doing? There's nothing wrong with being busy. Of course, as long as we are busy with the right things and we don't get so busy that we begin to think of our busyness as a way of impressing God. Many of us think that because we're keeping busy and we're just doing stuff, oh God, look at me. No, he's not impressed with that. He's impressed with what you're keeping yourself busy doing. Even that in itself is a trap of Satan to distract us from true spirituality. So I close with this. You and I, we are transforming into Christ-like character. 
And we need to realize that the accusations that were being brought against these Christians that Peter was speaking to were from the unbelieving world, and they were false accusations. And Peter doesn't rebuke his Christian brothers and sisters by telling them to shape up or ship out, but rather he reminds them that even when false accusations are brought against you, a thorough investigation of your life should determine whether your character is in line with God's word. How is your character? You can be the greatest leader. You can be the greatest person. But if your character isn't good, all of that is for naught. How is your character? How is it? And every once in a while, you need to let people tell you. And I've done that in my life, and sometimes I've had to hear some hard things that need to change my character. Godly character and behavior will convince your accusers that you are living a consistent Christian life, and it might even lead that person to believe in Christ. I've had a person call me here that I worked with over 20 years ago and invited me over. And we had coffee. And I worked with him in a shop. And those weren't easy days. Trust me, they weren't. They weren't easy days. And two days after our visit, he texts me and he says, I didn't have the heart to ask you this in person. But when the day comes, would you say a few words about me? Would you say a few words about me? In other words, he's asking me to represent him that day that he dies to do his funeral. You can do that too. It takes a lifetime to get there with people. A lifetime. But you can do it. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, transform us into Christ-likeness in the same way that your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds And glorify your Father in heaven and want what you have. Oh, I pray this for this congregation of ours, Lord, that we will be more like you and less like the world. And Father, we confess to you today that we are in some really difficult situations. And we are working in some very, very challenging places. And we have to work beside some difficult people, Lord. But help us not to give up on them. Many of them are not yet Christians. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that they would see something in us that would attract them to you, God, that would attract them to want what we have. Oh, I pray that they would desire this. And Father, I would ask that we would become more like you. And when the world accuses us falsely, because we're deciding to make decisions that look different, I pray that we will stand on what we know is truth. And by doing so, it will change their minds. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. As we close today, um, we would stand. Um, I want to sing a song that's it's an older song but one that I just love. Um, If you don't know the song, please just listen to the words and let it be the prayer of your heart.
is changing us and I see the change in you family and I hope you see the change in me it takes a lifetime it really does <laughs> but I encourage you with this live such good lives among the pagans the not yet Christians that though they accuse you of doing wrong whether that's in the workplace in your family units out in the community wherever that is let them see your good deeds and may they glorify God on the day that he visits us. You're going to have a great week. Live this out. God bless you. God keep you. In Jesus' name, amen.